Okay, well, thank you for being a part of our uh, service today. It's good to see everyone. And uh, you say, Pastor, wait a minute, you can't see anybody. Yeah, I know, but I know people are watching, and I appreciate you doing that. This is an opportunity for us as a church family to uh, be together and to uh, spend some time talking about what's going on uh, as it relates to uh, what's happening here at church and what's happening in our culture and what's happening in our world. And uh, that's something that uh, is, changes every day, uh, literally. And so uh, just wanted to take a couple minutes to let you know that we're looking at uh, options for uh, different things here at the church about getting back together and ways that we can do that and ways that it'll be effective for us. And so um, just keep your eye on the email and uh, join us if you can uh, by way of the Zoom calls that we do. Uh, those are always neat times for us as a church family. And so I encourage you uh, with that. Also encourage you to pray for one another and uh, be in prayer for one another. There's a lot of things that uh, happen in our culture and happen in our families during this time. Uh, some people are still out of work. Uh, be praying for them. Be praying uh, and, and ministering to people as you have opportunity. Uh, sometimes it's just a phone call. Uh, I know that uh, I've had uh, an, a number of phone calls. I do that every week. And uh, I, just, I just know that those calls mean a lot to those that you call. And so I encourage you to use the phone. And you might say, well, Pastor, uh, I, I don't know that many people. Get to know them on the phone. Uh, this is a great time uh, because you have so much time uh, to be able to do that. So I want to invite you today to turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we're going to talk today about uh, a king, Saul, who is in decline. Um, it doesn't take very long for Saul to begin this downward step, this downward spiral. Uh, we've considered uh, what happened and how he has become king. We've looked at that in the book as we've studied the book. And uh, one of the things that, that took place was there was a victory um, and, uh, and uh, there, was, there was good things happening. And uh, it seems like Saul got off to the right, uh, off to the, to the right path initially, uh, but his decline began relatively quickly. In fact, if you look at verse 1, it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, and that's where the narrative for today's message comes from, two years into his reign, we're going to see Saul in decline. And uh, isn't it true, though, for all of us that when, we're, when there's a victory in our lives and when, when we have a heart of, of uh, uh, obedience and we're following God and we're serving God, we're living by His Word, that um, we, we are in a really good place. God is, is going to use us, and God's going to give us victory in our heart, and, and uh, we're going to see Him do great things as we pray and as we read His Word and as we study His Word. But there's a problem. The problem comes when you and I don't believe God, when we don't exhibit great faith, when we are disobedient. And it can cause great problems in our lives. That's what happened to Saul. Saul had it going for him. Saul was the king. Saul had the nation behind him. And Saul made some choices that were very, very troubling. Israel and King Saul went through a similar thing. One of the things you'll notice in these next three chapters as we cover them, 13, 14, 15, are going to all deal with the, the reign, the early part of his reign, and then also his relationship to Samuel. Uh, Samuel was a key player in all of this, and you'll see that as we get into the message today. His true character is revealed, and, and the way he really lives his life in these chapters, and sadly, what you're going to find when you get to the end of, of Saul's life, you're going to find out that he counseled with a witch, amazingly, and then ended up committing suicide on the battlefield, took his own sword and killed himself. That's a, that's a decline. That's a, that's a horrible, horrible end to a man who had really everything going for him if he only would have obeyed God, if he only would have obeyed God's uh, minister to him, Samuel, in the midst of all that was happening in his life. So let's take a few minutes this, mor this morning and uh, look at how uh, this all happened. What was the, what was the trip like for him? I think the first thing we see in this passage is in verses 1 through 4. Let me read those for you. It says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and 
in the mountains of Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And verse 4 says, Now all Israel heard it, said that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at uh, Gilgal. So the beginning passage in this section of Scripture really makes it clear that Saul wanted an army for himself. He wanted, he wanted a group of men who would stand with him and fight with him. And isn't it interesting that Jonathan, his son, is with him? He takes 3,000, 3,000 men. Verse 2 says 3,000. If you go back and look at chapter 10 and verse 8, it says that he could have had 300,000 men in the army. But he just chose a few. He chose 3,000. I don't know if he thought that God was with him and that, that he was going to have great victories regardless of the number of people that were with him. But in this, in this uh, context, in what's happening here, he takes 2,000 men, Jonathan takes 1,000 men, and Jonathan's the one who makes the attack. Jonathan's the one who gets the victory. He defeated the Philistines with 1,000 men at the town of Geba. Verse 3, it says something really interesting. It says then, in the middle of the verse, it says, Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Typically, in those days, when there was a victory on the battlefield, the one who was the victor blew the trumpet. This would have been, this would have been Jonathan's job. This would have been for Jonathan to do. But Saul blew the trumpet. Notice what verse 4 says. Verse 4 says, all of Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines. No, no, it was Jonathan. But Saul took all the credit. Saul took all of the, the victory accolades unto himself. I think one of the first things that led to Saul's decline was pride. He thought as king he deserved all those things. Instead, he should have said to Jonathan, Jonathan, blow the trumpet. Let the people know that you've had a, a great victory over the Philistines. So Saul was credited with this victory, not, not Jonathan. There's something else in this passage, beginning in verse 5, that we see that's a, a troubling thing as it relates to Saul's character. And it's, it's the idea or the thought of unbelief. Not only did he have pride, but he really didn't believe God. He didn't really believe that what God was doing or how God was doing things was going to be the best, the very best way for him to go. We do that a lot, don't we? We go our own way. We decide and we choose what to believe and what not to believe or who to believe and who not to believe or whether this scripture applies or this scripture doesn't apply. We kind of take bits and pieces Saul, in his downfall, in his decline, began not to believe. Look at what it says in verse 5. It says, Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand uh, which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days, according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Very clearly in this passage, you realize that Saul did not believe God. Saul did not believe Samuel. Saul did not believe God's prophet who was going to show him and do for him what he needed as it related to his worship. Samuel was the priest. Listen carefully. Samuel was the priest. Saul was not the priest. Saul had no right, according to God's law, 
to offer a burnt offering. Saul was way out of step with what God wanted. But he forcefully, because Samuel didn't show up, he forcefully said, bring the burnt offering. He burned the offering. He made the sacrifice. And he did it exactly the wrong way. Sometimes we are impatient, aren't we? Sometimes we see that the enemy is after us. The enemy has outnumbered us. That's what Saul sees here. Where we're overwhelmed by what's happening around us. In fact, they were so overwhelmed. Look at it with me in verse 6. It said, They people hid in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and in pits. They actually hid. They actually hid because they wanted nothing to do with the Philistine army. In fact, if you keep reading there in that text, it says that even some of them crossed back over the Jordan in order to avoid any confrontation with the Philistines. This is an amazing, amazing narrative of how mankind can go against what God wants because of fear, because of anxiety, because of trouble in their soul. How God is doing what he is doing is always perfect. But man, when man gets involved, when, when we get into God's plan and mess with what God is trying to accomplish or what God has already given in his word, it's going to be disaster. It's going to be trouble. In fact, when you read through this, you realize, and, it, and it's, it's really interesting how the narrative reads. It's almost like, well, just Saul, Samuel didn't show up and Saul just took care of it. Saul didn't believe God. Saul didn't believe that Samuel was coming. Two years, two years after Saul took his kingship before the people. And Saul is in a place of unbelief. What was God doing? What was happening here? God was testing Saul's faith. He was saying to Saul, Saul, are you going to believe me? Are you going to believe my word? Are you just going to do your own thing? Are you just going to follow after what you want? It's very evident here that Saul was very impatient. He was impatient with God. He was impatient with Samuel. And more importantly, he was showing some spiritual immaturity to even think, to even, to even consider that he could do something, that he could, that he could be something that God never intended for him to be or ever intended for him to do. Saul was in trouble. I want you to consider a passage of Scripture with me this morning. And it's, it's Psalm 27. You probably know this. You can turn there if you like. Let me just read these verses to you. Verses 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Listen carefully, folks. Scripture is very clear on this. God takes care of our enemies. God takes care of our enemies. What does he want from us? He wants obedience, <clears throat> not impatience. <clears throat> he wants obedience. He wants us to believe him, to trust him, to know that God is at work, that God is working in our, our midst and in our lives. And even though around us there are things happening that we don't understand or we think there are attacks on us because of our faith or because of who we are, we need to trust God. He's my light. He's my salvation. That, 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 that psalm says, whom shall I fear? The, the, the answer to that question is no one. There shouldn't be fear in the, in, the, in the believer's life because of all that God has done and all that God will continue to do. There's something else in this passage that is very troubling as it relates to Saul. Begin reading with me in verse 9. It says, So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. By the way, God's perfect timing. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. This is, this is really interesting, that, that, he might, that he might greet him, the idea that he might bless him. Samuel, you're here. 
What a blessing. It's great to see you. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered, uh, Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said to himself, the Philistines will now come down on me in Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Folks, listen. Listen very carefully. The burnt offering was not his job. The burnt offering was Samuel's job. It wasn't Saul's job. It wasn't for Saul to accomplish. It wasn't for Saul to say or do before the people. Samuel was the priest. He was the one who would make the burnt offering. And what's really sad about this is because of this, Saul, number three, is disqualified. His kingdom, because of this, was doomed. He would not reign. His family would not reign over Israel anymore. God was going to take that from him. Why is that? What happened? Well, if you look closely, there's a fourth thing here. Okay? Not only did he, is he disqualified, not only was he in the, in the beginning filled with pride and unbelief, but there's something else here. He was deceptive. He was deceptive. Notice that he greets Saul, but then also, look at verse um, 11. Here's what he says. He says, when I saw that the people were scattered. Notice the words in there, when I saw. Think about that with me for a minute. When I saw what was going on. Now, folks, this is important for us. Rather than trust God, we go with what we can see. We go with what's important to us rather than what's important to God. Rather than to believe God, we just go with what we see. By the way, if you go back to the book of Genesis, that's what got Eve in trouble. That's what got Adam in trouble. Eve saw that the fruit was good. Here in this passage, he says, I saw. And then it's very interesting what happens. In, in the end of this, um, verse 12, it says, I felt compelled to sacrifice. I had a responsibility to sacrifice because of everything going on around me, because things were collapsing around me, because the people were hidden, because they were scattered everywhere. I felt compelled to do this. Now it's interesting, isn't it? What's, what's, what's going on here? Completely and totally, Saul was out of the will of God. He wasn't interested in God's will. He wasn't interested in doing what God wanted. In fact, think about this with me for a second. He thought that he could disobey God and get away with it. Now, you and I would never do that, right? We would never say, I know what God says. I'm just going to do this anyway because he's probably not going to do anything in response to that. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but one day we'll stand before him. And one day we'll give an account for how we live our lives. Verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You've done foolishly. Out of the will of God, doing your own thing because of your unbelief, because of your impatience. Look at what it says. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not continue. Think about this with me, folks. God had a plan for Saul. God had a plan for, for the nation. And Saul torpedoed those plans by his own impatience, by his own unbelief, by the fact that he would not believe God. Verse 14, the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. We all know, of course, that was David. 
And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul, you've been a disobedient child. You've done your own thing. You, you felt this was more important. And now your kingdom will not continue, verse 14, the beginning of verse 14 says. Folks, listen, listen carefully to this. Saul was in a crisis. He felt there was a crisis happening in the nation. He thought there was a crisis happening with his army. The Philistines were attacking. There were things happening that, that were out of his control. But crisis does not mean that you and I have a license to disobedience to God. Because there's a crisis in my life, because there's something that I can't control, that doesn't mean we can be disobedient. That doesn't mean that we can take the Word of God and, and, and set it aside and come up with our own idea, our own plan. We need to understand that God's at work. Sometimes our thought is, well, listen, I can be disobedient and, you know, God will understand me. God will understand why I did this. I think Saul thought that. I mean, there was no hesitation. When you go back to verse 9, you realize he says to the people, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me, and he offered the burnt offering. There wasn't even any like, suggestion of the fact that he hesitated, that he waited, that he thought it through, that he prayed about it, that he even had any idea that he was not going to do it. He was going to do it, period. He ends up with 600 men. 600 men. Look at verse 15. Samuel rose went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people uh, present with him, about 600 men. He started with 3,000. Now he's down to 600 after his disobedience and after all that happened. Israel was in trouble. In fact, they're going to have three battles now. Verse 16, Jonathan, his son, the people pr present with them remain in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash, Notice verse 17, the raiders of the Philistines came out in three companies. They're coming on purpose. They're coming after Israel. They probably have heard all the things that have happened, and now they're down to 600 men, the Israel is, and they knew what they needed to do. So they went all different directions. Verses 17 and 18 tell us. <clears throat> but Israel couldn't help themselves. In fact, they were, they were so limited by the Philistines the verses 19 through 22 tell us that they didn't even have the weapons they needed. They didn't have the, the weapons. They were, they were totally helpless because they had, the Philistines had said, listen, there'll be no blacksmiths, so they couldn't make any kinds of weapons of war. In fact, look at what it says. It says all the Israelites, verse 20, would go down to the Philistines to sharpen their plowshare, his mattocks, his axe, and his sickle, and the charge for sharpening with a, what was a pim uh, for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, the axes, to set the points of the goad. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. They had no way to fight the battle. They were completely helpless in this fight. So it came about, verse 22, on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found. But there were found, the end of verse 22, they were found in the hand of Saul and in the hand of Jonathan. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass at Michmash. What did they do? They went out, the Philistines went out and blocked off this area so that the, the people of God, Saul's army, 600 men, could not leave. There was trouble on the horizon. So what do, we, what do we do with this text? What do we do with chapter 13 here? The beginning of the fall of, of Saul and the decline of his life as king. Here's what we do. Let me give you three things to take away with you. First of all, overwhelming enemies, trials, or hardships may be a part of our life. There's nothing that we can do about those things. Fear and panic don't help us. Wondering what next doesn't help us. In fact, we need to learn at that particular point in our lives to turn to the Lord, to turn to Him and to Him only. Let me read a passage to you from Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, if you want to turn there quickly with me. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. 
Listen to these verses. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you salvation and that from God. What does it say there? Don't in any way be terrified by your enemies. You will have enemies. You will have trials. You will have hardships. Those things come. Do not be terrified by those things. I like what Psalm 118 says. Listen to this verse. Psalm 118. 118 and verse 6 says this. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. Boy, if Saul could have gotten that message, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. Would you realize that and grab that and grasp that? God is on my side. So those overwhelming things that come, Remember, God is on your side. Secondly, disobedience is a disqualification for service. Luke 9 and verse 23 says, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, if you're going to be a believer, if you're going to be serious about your faith, you're going to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow him. I hope that's our heart's desire. I hope that's what we really want to see happen in our lives. Because listen, folks, that disobedience in our lives sets us aside. In fact, disobedience sets us aside so much that we actually have to regroup before we get back into the battle because of our disobedience and not trusting God and not seeing what God is and has done for us. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who are Christ's, His children, have crucified the flesh and its passions and its desires. Folks, listen, one of the most important things we can do is set aside ourselves. Set aside ourselves. Let us go by the wayside and let God be glorified and let him be the center of all the attention in our lives. You see what happened to Saul? Saul said, I think I know better and so I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna bail out on God. I'm not going to listen to his priest. I'm going to go ahead and, and offer that burnt offering, and I'm going to go ahead and do those things. God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to let God know that we're committed, that we're denying ourselves, and that we're never, ever, ever going to give up on him. Disobedience is a disqualification for service. There's one more thing that I want you to see, and I'd like you to turn to this passage in Psalm number 28. Psalm 28. The last thing that I want you to realize, and I wish wish the story of Saul would be different and we could show this to you in 1 Samuel, but the last thing I want you to take away from this is that divine guidance is available now. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 says, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. God cares about those needs. God cares about the trials and the hardships and the enemies. He cares about all of that. If Saul would have just grasped that and been obedient instead of being disobedient and been patient instead of impatient, he would have seen God do things that would have secured his kingdom. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen because he didn't believe that divine guidance was available right now. He wasn't willing to say, God, I know that that you know all about this and nothing that man can do to me can harm me because you're on my side, Lord. Grasp that idea. Grasp that concept. The Lord's on my side. We're in a situation in our world today where there's a lot of things happening, a lot of hardships, a lot of difficulties, a lot of trials, a lot of troubles. The Lord's on my side. The Lord's on your side. I won't fear what man can do to me. We have divine guidance available now. Psalm 28, verse 7. Listen listen to this. 
I close with this. The Lord is my strength and my shield. The, my heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise Him. With my song, I will praise Him. Let me read that one more time for you. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I'm helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise Him. So, what's the, what's the praise coming out of your soul today? By the way, I hope you're listening to the music that we provide each week. Adam and Katie Christopher put together a playlist for us to listen to. I hope you're listening to that music. I hope you're letting that be, be something that prepares you or that you listen to after the, the message to encourage you, to build you up, to just focus on the Lord and focus on who He is and what He's done. Those, those songs really encourage me, and I, ho I hope they encourage you as well. But this psalm actually says that. With my song, I will praise Him. Why, why am I going to praise Him? Because He's my strength. He's my shield. Saul's decline, listen folks, Saul's decline was caused by him not viewing and seeing God for who he was, but for taking his eyes off of God. For figuring it out that he could do it himself when in reality he couldn't do it. What a sad, sad state for a person to be in, especially someone who was the king over a nation. It was almost like he forgot. It was almost like he didn't want to be part of that. Oh, he wanted it on his terms but not on God's terms. And so as you look to God for guidance, remember that His guidance comes from Him, not from you. His guidance comes from His Word. His guidance comes as we praise Him and as we honor Him. He's my strength. He's my shield. My heart trusted in Him, the psalmist said, and I am helped. You'll be helped. I will be help, helped when we trust in Him. May God help us to do that. May God help us to trust Him. God never wants to save us, allow us to be a part of His family, allow us to be serving Him and honoring Him and see us go in decline. That's never what God wants. God never wants us not to trust Him. God never wants us to have so much pride that we can't trust Him to do what He's going to do. He doesn't want us to be impatient. He doesn't want us to be disqualified from serving. He doesn't, he doesn't have any interest in us failing. Can you, can you see that? Can you understand that today? Saul didn't do that. And Saul started into decline that would end in suicide. May God help you today to see him as your strength and your shield. And if you're watching this video today or listening to this message, I just, want you to, I just want you to consider this. If you're not a believer, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to trust him today. You say, Pastor, how does that happen? <clears throat> it happens by repenting of our sin and by turning to Christ in faith to believe that what he did on the cross, when he died, he was buried, he rose again the third day, what he did, he did for me. He did for you. Trust him today. Let's pray. God, thank you that you care about every need in our life. Lord, use these, these verses, this scripture today, to, to open our hearts, to un help us to understand that you want us not to be in decline, but you want us to be in growth. You want us to be maturing. And Lord, the poor example of Saul in this passage is one that we need to learn from, and then we need to set it aside and pursue God with all of our heart. Help us to do that today, God. Use these verses to change our hearts and to change our lives. Well, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.